Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce, introduce you our next speaker, Peter Todd. He is originally from Canada, Canada living in Toronto. Uh, he is our regular speaker. Uh, he visited HTPP last year, also two, two years ago. And he will have interesting presentation about insider attacks. I'm especially interested in this presentation because, because I'm like a security expert, but security consultant, I'm, I'm involved in this topic. So welcome, Peter. Thank you. You know, I'm uh, glad he said he was especially interested because of consulting, not because he wanted to go pull off an uh, insider attack. But uh, yeah, you know, and dishonest devs, I mean, you know, that's certainly going to be a thing. People are going to do it. And, you know, you really got asked, like, and I always kind of look at security this way, you know, what are we trying to prevent? You know, what's the, what's the bad thing we're trying to prevent? And there's a lot of issues. You know, I think we have governments, of course, who dislike encryption, dislike security, want more power over you, basically. And, you know, I mean, I'm also an Australian citizen, and one of the things I'm kind of worried about is uh, this, which is Australia. Uh, about, what, a year and a half ago, two years now, passed a law where essentially they can go force people to add back doors to technology. And, you know, it's a very, very harsh law. I mean, you could be a developer working at a company, working on an open source project, and you get contacted by someone claiming to be from the Australian government, and they go and tell you, well, if you go tell anyone about this, other than maybe your lawyer, you're going to go to jail. And uh, by the way, we have a few changes you want to go make to your big project. And if you tell your boss, you can go to jail. If you go and you know, say anything about this, you can go to jail. Oh, and by the way, everything I just said, it's basically not tracked. You know, a judge didn't approve it. It was you know, just kind of rubber stamped at some government agency. I mean, at least that got in the law. But you know, it's a scary thing. And as bad as it is for the devs, well, the reality is that's an example of a dishonest dev from your point of view. You know, that dev is doing something you, you don't want them to do. And you also get stuff like this. Um, you know, this is one of quite a few examples I went and found, but essentially, it's one of these many, many altcoins, fork of the Bitcoin source code. And a uh, little, uh, you know, not the easiest to read, but uh, there you go. So, you know, that's like IRC bootstrapping. And here, it does something funny, C read, whatever, whatever. Well, it turns out once you actually, you know, compile it and it resolves macros and all the other stuff, ah, P open. Well, what does P open do? Well, it just opens an arbitrary process based on something called like priv message. Huh, priv message, privacy or something? No, it's basically a backdoor. Someone sends a special IRC command, it just runs this magic message, and then they can do whatever you want. And, you know, it's a little sketchy as to whether or not this has happened, who is actually at fault. There's like many, many levels of meta. But allegedly, something along these lines back toward, um, you know, the exchange Cripsy and stole a big pile of money. And from my understanding, Cripsy, well, they were having a server with hot wallets of multiple different currencies all running together. And I'll, I'll go talk more about mitigations for that kind of scenario. But, you know, obviously, you would have wanted to go catch this if you were Cripsy. I mean, even if all you were doing was running that one, one thing, you definitely want to go catch it. And so we can kind of boil this down. And you know, I like boiling this down because ultimately security software is different than other software. You know, if I have Adobe Photoshop, my goal with Adobe Photoshop is to edit some images, you know, maybe morph my face into some celebrity or something. You know, there's, it's pretty clear to the user whether or not it's working. You know, that's, that's kind of our, uh, our first line here. You know, does our software do what we want it to do? And even if you don't have technical expertise, you can determine the answer to that question for the most part. You know, you wanted to do something, did it do it? The problem with security software is, our real question there is, does our software not do what we want, what we don't want it to do? I don't know how much I screwed up. But you can see, like, the whole thought process is very different. We're trying to say, well, what things could have it have done that we wouldn't want it to do, ensure that it actually does just what we want it to do. It's a much harder problem. And it's also a problem that's very difficult for other people to go figure out. And, you know, sort of like, 
I mean, I don't know if you've seen uh, the Simpsons one, but uh, it's sort of like the anti-tiger rock. You know, I claim I have this rock and it keeps away tigers. Well, does it keep away tigers? Uh, do you see any tigers? I don't know, I guess those shirts are kind of orange, sort of like a tiger. But other than the orange shirts, like it's doing a pretty good job keeping the tigers away. In fact, I claim that it turned the tigers into volunteers. You can't really disprove this, right? But, you know, the, the anti-tiger rock is an even better example of this. What we're really concerned about in the security world is the anti-tiger rock that was made by the Pro-Tiger Foundation, and inside the anti-tiger rock happens to be a little microphone, and it's recording you know, all your conversations about tigers and uploading GPS coordinates to the roving band of tigers that are going to go maul you. And it can get even worse than that, because we often have secure hardware you know, and security-related stuff. I mean, I got that in my little uh, presenter's gift basket thing. Uh, I guess you might have got one, too. I've really, I've never been here as a normal person, so I don't know what to give you guys. But <laughs> what, what's in that thing? Like, and it's even worse, because, you know, I come here, like, I'm all, you know, cool Peter Todd, but, well, they know who I am. And they just gave me a bag with one of those things in it. Like, should I really be plugging that into my laptop? Well, we're at it. Okay, my bag's still there. <laughs> well, you know, I used to be an electronics designer, so I figured I can, I can totally solve this one. I uh, got a heavy object and smashed it open, and uh, I held it up to the, to the window in my hotel room, and uh, one of you guys is probably going to figure out which hotel room I have, but uh, at least I'm leaving that tomorrow. And I happen to know that USB has four wires. Two of them are signal, two of them are data. Well, I see two wires going from one end to the other, and I see one kind of going in a little circle there. And I happen to know, or at least I think I do, that the signal wires are in the middle and the data wires on the, on the outside. Pretty good, right? I thought it was good enough. And now I know that my laptop is separate from my phone you know, the other end of that cable going off to my phone, which is rather important because I'll show you another port there, you know, my, uh, my security key, but this thing, 39 or 1394, well, it's actually a FireWire port, which might date my laptop back a couple years, but FireWire is famous for having the problem where anything connected to your FireWire port could just download main memory or write main memory, or do it really whatever it wanted, so, you know, as silly as this thing is, it is actual real security. It did something, it prevented something from happening, which was my phone communicating my laptop, and my laptop communicating my phone. You know, that's, that's all well and good, that's kind of useful. Although, there's kind of an issue of, I mean, I did all that, but how do you know that your little black USB condom actually did something? You don't. At least you know how to check it, but me checking it didn't directly help you in quite the same way. And, you know, I think I've seen a lot of people making these kinds of criticisms about the security of, you know, Bitcoin and other software. You know, your node is not a full node unless you read the protocol spec and write all the software yourself, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, the way I like to refute this is to really talk about whistleblowing. When I go read the protocol spec, which in Bitcoin, of course, is the source code, as it is in any sane consensus system. I can go read it, I can think about it, I can decide for myself, did it or didn't it work? Well, that's all well and good for me, but the important thing is if I do find something that's wrong, I can tell all you guys. And so long as you guys are using the same software, me noticing this is effectively whistleblowing. You know, I am finding something wrong and telling you guys so you can go make an informed decision whether or not you'll still use the software. Now, there's a lot of catches here. You know, for instance, are you actually downloading the same software as I am? You know, are you actually using the same versions and so on? But in the big picture, this is a good idea. You know, this is really one of the, you know, real core things that makes software different from hardware. And that if you have software on hardware that's secure, the software can be audited by others. And there are many processes in place where you can be sure that you're running the right software, and chances are if there was something wrong with it, someone would notice. 
you know. The big picture is all well and good, but how does this actually work in practice? You know, how close are we to this ideal? Well, I decided to make a little program. And uh, there you go, I call it uh, all your base. Um, I'm not going to show every single command I typed in, but since, you know, made my initial commit there. That's, your, that's in Rust, by the way. Uh, yeah, go Rust. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool thing, right? It, uh, you know, it tells the user, of course, that they're securing the base, because you, know, you want to tell the user that you're securing something so that they think it's secure. And then uh, you know, here, very important, it uh, makes it impossible to read, write, or execute the base. Of course, you know, if you can't do that, you obviously can't get it. And you know, just to be clear, base secure, it. Gotta, gotta double check that, right? And uh, you, know, you might go run that command, and you might wonder, is, is this really a good idea? Does this work? And uh, let's go and have a hypothetical guy, which we'll call a uh, good guy. And uh, oh yeah, there's you know, me pushing stuff, you know, but well, ignore that. It's like it's not too important. But you know, there's there's the good guy, right? Git clone. He sees it up on GitHub, and it is actually live, by the way. You can go download this. Although uh, you might want to wait till the end of the talk before you run it. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's a uh, rest is very convenient. You can just do cargo run. You know, compiles whatever. Securing the base, base secured. Ooh, done. Pretty simple, right? Well, you know, you might want to double check what that actually did. And, ah, uh, oh, funny enough, you know, you might have noticed, well, that command thing, like, if I just say command new in Rust, it doesn't actually run the command. You know, that's what's called a builder. It kind of builds what I'm about to do in memory. But to actually, like, run it, I got to go and do this, you know, output thing and expect says, well, you know, something failed, whatever. And, you know, I'm a. Mr. Good Guy, he figures, well, I mean, I might as well go fix this. So he uh, adds a patch, yada yada, commits it, you know, actually run the process. Pretty, uh, pretty good change, right? And uh, there we go. So let's go assume that, you know, he put a pull request up on GitHub, waited a bit. I'm pretty fast, so I, you know, get back in a, in a few minutes uh, and uh, oh, do a git pull. Enumerating, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, oh, that's funny. There's a, there's a readme file now, and there's a, there's a main file with some changes. So, you know, I mean, what actually changed? Ah, if you run a git log, well, Peter Todd, merge remote tracking branch, you know, actually run the process. Looks pretty good, right? Like, if you guys were, uh, were Rust dev, do you think at this point it'd be safe to run the command? All right, if you guys were Rust dev not watching this talk, what do you think would be safe to watch the command? <laughs> well, let's actually see what the file says. Huh, that's funny. Because uh, this here, that's sort of the do anything no matter what. And I guess the do anything no matter what said it do anything no matter what. Oh, that's funny. It looks like it's going to make every single file on my computer uh, writable and readable and executable. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I got nothing against communism, I guess, but uh, you know, I don't want to share my files with everyone. So, uh, gee, uh, yeah. What went wrong here? <laughs> and I want to kind of approach this at many, many different levels. And maybe the very simplest level is, well, why did this bug happen in the first place? You know, like why why didn't I allegedly, at least, assuming I'm a nice guy, uh, write the code right in the first place? And if we go back a bit, there we go, version one. Well, people who use Rust will know that Rust normally would go tell you if you're creating something that should be used. You know, this whole bit of misunderstanding about command. Ideally, you'd get a Compiler error, which actually currently in Rust doesn't happen, which uh, I should add a pull request to this tonight. But all right, the bit of ergonomics, we could go fix that. And even then, you know, we f we fixed our root cause. But what's the next thing that went wrong? You know, what happened next? Well, where are we? Here. You see, this commit in this commit in Git. 
you know, this is ultimately just a hash of all the different files and all the history. And then this bit here, this is sort of just a nice thing. It's Git basically just showing you, well, you know, what's the difference between this and the thing that came prior? And unfortunately, Git, I don't think really has security in mind because it doesn't show you what actually changed here. Like, remember, if you propose some changes to me, what you're seeing here is the difference in those changes. But I somehow have to go add those changes to my repo. And in my repo, I added a readme file. All right, so I have one set of history, you know, you have another set of history, and I have to go merge them together, which means that the differences are actually differences between this and this and this and this. And the way Git works is the user-friendly thing of, well, assume that whoever wrote this is a nice person and just did the obvious thing, which was only do this changes. If you actually look at this commit, and I didn't figure out a way to actually show this on screen, but of course, it doesn't actually merge this. It merges something totally different, and Git's UIs just don't show this. You know, and unfortunately, I'm not very surprised. Um, I kind of thought of this writing up this talk as, you know, could this happen? Oh, sure enough, it does. But, you know, Git's not written by people, I think, who have security in mind. I mean, the even the fact that these are SHA-1 hashes, like back in 2004, 2005, whenever Git was made, cryptographers were already warning Linus, SHA-1's not secure. You know, and currently, if you're clever and have a bunch of money, you can make collisions to SHA-1 hashes so that one hash could be matched by multiple different files. You know, there's a lot of nuance to exactly what that statement means and so on, but long story short, like, Git's not really the right tool to be using, yet it's sort of the only tool we have. But even if you solved, say, these problems, I mean, there's still more that can go wrong. Like, for starters, who actually made that change? Well, all right, in this talk, obviously, I did, probably. But I'm going to go claim to you guys, you know, I was trying to give a talk about how great Git was, and I didn't, I didn't make that commit. Well, who might have? Well, let's go back a bit to... Ah, there we go. Yeah, right, so I wrote some code, I committed it, and then I pushed it to GitHub. But what's, what's this actually saying here? You know, the authenticity host GitHub can't be established, key fingerprint, you want to continue? I mean, I don't know, I always type yes. All right, how many of you guys type yes? Well, yeah, and nothing like in Git actually knew what computer I was really talking to. So it'd be quite plausible for someone to man and mill attacked me there. You know, I'm not necessarily going to notice that the code I wrote got changed on GitHub. You know, I'm, I'm just doing code locally. And if I have more than one computer, chances are I'm going to have different repos or maybe a little out of sync. And I don't know, I even I'll admit, pretty often I'll just type git pull when I'm pretty sure I had my laptop was up to date. Maybe, maybe it was, I don't know. I'll just type git pull. And maybe I'll just look at it with git log, with the patch thing, see what emerged. You know, these, these problems exist in many different layers. And that's just not secure. But it's even worse than that, because, all right, let's suppose we fixed this. Let's suppose we, you know, made the git thing have a hash of git's identity or so on. What did I do just uh, prior to that? Well, I made some commit. That's all well and good. I probably ran it at some point. In fact, the, the good guy also ran it. And where are we? Wait, commit, I should run. Here we are. Notice how he did run the code before he actually like looked at it? I mean, it's a pretty easy mistake to make. Again, I'll admit, even I wound up doing this more than you know, more than once. Again. And the moment you run that code, Cargo could have done anything. It could have gone and backdoored Git to go and patch out you know, these diffs so you wouldn't even see it. Like, anything at this point is totally untrusted, really. You know, the moment I ran some code from the source that I'm trying to view, it's over. But even if I looked at the code, you know, all well, this project doesn't have it. Any sane project is going to have dependencies. 
And it's pretty easy to go have a complex project with a bunch of dependencies and have the reviewers not review the dependencies. You know, someone asked me to audit some source code. At some point, I'm going to go stop. And I personally know of an example of this, which I ran into in practice, which, of course, is the Zcash Trusted Setup. And I was asked by Zuko to be part of that Zcash Trusted Setup. And I'm one of, what is it, five people or seven people or something who initially made those secret keys, essentially, that get turned into a public key that then makes all of Zcash work. And with Zcash, if the secret keys are compromised, you can go counterfeit Zcash currency at will. Well, Zcash was pretty clever about it. They used something called deterministic builds, which they would go and you know, have a set of source code and compile it in a way that someone else could then rerun that whole code chain, rerun you know, that compiler, and get the exact same output. So then when I did this trusted setup, I started off with, like everyone else did, a burned DVD produced, allegedly, by this deterministic build process. And at the time, my thinking was, well, you know, this is all well and good. I'll just, you know, get this DVD. They say it's deterministic build. They know where it's all coming from, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, I don't really know what that software did, but you can go audit it, and it's reasonable to audit the dependencies a little back. And then when I actually looked at it in detail, probably about a year later, I realized, well, the deterministic build was using like non-deterministic build sources built you know, two days ago. And no one can recreate them. And they knew at the time that this whole thing was going to happen. So in fact, anyone who ran the Rust or had access to the Rust compiler build process could have backdoored Zcash. Of course, as it turns out, Zcash, that version 0, also had a bug in it that could inflate the currency undetectably anyway. So, <sighs> didn't really matter so much. But again, like, kind of a problem there. And then we can also go ask, I mean, all right, this all sounds totally broken. Well, you know, do the usual big slide thing. What went wrong? I think we know. How do we fix this? Well, if you were in this position where somehow this command suddenly went and rewrote you know, your whole file system, who would you blame? I mean, I did the merge, right? Well, I mean, that's not signed. So right there, your average project kind of fails at this. And since this isn't signed, I could just as easily claim, no, no, this whole SSH business, it really did happen. You know, it's not my fault, it's GitHub's fault, or some man in the middle attack. Well, you know, in terms of how do we improve things, like step number one is actually be able to assign some blame, figure out what happened. And, you know, in my consulting practice, I wind up getting a lot of clients who, you know, have databases of things. Often the databases are internal, totally trusted, sort of, run by their system ins. And even I tell them, you know, you really want to go add, add a blockchain to this. And when I talk about a blockchain, I mean a chain of blocks. I mean a blockchain in the sense Git almost is. Purely so that you can go figure out which admin might have broken into the system and made it to put in valid data. You know, which computer got compromised. Currently, I can't really figure out any of this because we don't have any keys attached. So how do we fix this? Number one, like actually start signing some code. I mean, it seems silly, but people aren't doing this at all, you know, outside of a few projects. Bitcoin Core being uh, one of the few, few exceptions, and, uh, you know, Bitcoin Core, every single merge request is signed by someone. And there's a script you can go run to actually verify that these signatures are correct and from the approved list. And in case you're wondering, that's kind of your answer to the question, well, who, you know, who has push access to the GitHub repo? In theory, that, that, that's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, who has the PGP keys on the list of verified committers? But again, that's all well and good. You can go verify. In reality, 
people aren't running, you know, people aren't using the commands to actually go and do this. You know, people don't use git in a way where every time you type git pull, it actually checks this. So what can we fix this? Well, fortunately, we've got to go change how git works. You know, we've got to make it actually check signatures on things and actually have rules around this. You know, Rust itself, it's heavily reliant on bots that go build things. Why don't these bots actually go sign the, you know, sign the PGP pull requests that they make? They just don't yet. GitHub, to their credit, actually does now. Um, with GitHub, when you go and say edit a file within the GitHub web user interface, the commits do get signed. So there's some traceability there. But for, mo for most part, you know, projects don't do this. And you know, in this example with cargo, again, the list of cargo packages and the actual dependencies and so on, no one actually signs them. You know, there's a GitHub repo on GitHub, of course, with the entire set of every single cargo package out there. And that at least, you know, and again, like Rust is doing much better than most projects on this, but that at least has hashes. So you can say, you know, this Rust library, or create as they call them, actually matched this file. But if that, if that list of all this isn't signed, again, what actually went wrong when my cargo downloads the wrong thing? You know, I, I wouldn't even be surprised if it doesn't properly uh, check uh, you know, certificates and whatnot. Again, it's something I can go look into, but so much of this is broken there. Also, why was it that when I said cargo run, it ran in an environment that could touch my source code anyway? And in fact, in this case, I mean, there you go, good guy at desktop. Is that like his desktop where he has access to every single thing on his computer? Like, could that have re read his email? Again, developers tend to go run their code in environments which access to everything. You know, I at least, that's actually uh, cubes, and uh, that's uh, at least uh, cubes virtual machine dedicated just to Rust development. Oh, frankly, even I'm not very good at this. I mean, I share that across a few different things. <laughs> you know, we need better tooling for all this. And, you know, I say all this, but I think I'll kind of close with given that we have governments doing things like saying we got to back to our crypto, you know, we're in an environment where we may have to even do development anonymously. Rally is very few projects have anonymous developers, and all these issues become even harder, even when they're all fixed, when there isn't really someone to blame. You know, we're probably not going to get to the point where every single commit's reviewed properly. You know, every single dependency is reviewed properly. A lot of this is still going to be about people's reputations. And I don't really know what's going to happen if we have major projects with serious money behind them, or at least serious consequences, like Tor. I mean, you know, people's lives are at risk with Tor. Where anonymous devs exist, and we have to figure out how do we review this sufficiently to get around the fact that one of these devs doesn't really have much reputation to burn. You know, no one's, I mean, no one goes to jail right now for these kinds of bugs, and no one's kind of going to do that in the future if we're talking about a, a Bitcoin with a bunch of pseudonyms behind it. Like, these are very real issues, and it's only going to get worse. The threat's only going to get worse in the future. So we need to start solving this stuff now while it's possible. And also, I think, as paranoid as this whole talk is, Part of what we also need to solve is how do we do development and how do we run programs in a way where, for the stuff that doesn't matter, you know, for your computer games, for your fun projects, and so on, none of this stuff has to be done. I should be able to run some fun game on my computer and not have to worry about it attacking other things. And if that's true, at least that side of the development doesn't have to be so paranoid. Because the reality is these kinds of processes applied well are kind of toxic. And I, I can't get away from that. So, you know, I think it's really up to the OS developers to move beyond this. And with that, thank you. Peter. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Peter, thank you very much for your talk. I mean, I started to uh, code in Rust a few months ago. I totally fell in love uh, with this language, so it was amazing, love it. And guys, if you have any questions, raise your hand, please. And yeah, great.
Hi, thanks for the great talk. I want to ask, were there any um, attacks that were done um, because of a um, malicious, th that were caused by a malicious merge that you are aware of that had consequences? I'm not aware of any, and to be honest, I, for all I know, may have found something that hasn't actually been noticed before. Probably not, but, you know. I, ah, well, there you go. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, GitHub, the git commits don't lie. Uh, I did kind of write this, that part of the talk about two hours ago, so. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sh I would not be surprised if they're out there, and uh, sounds like there's an example. Any other questions? Your hands, yeah. Thanks, Peter. But it seems that the rabbit hole goes even deeper. With the processor compiling the code, you can have backdoors in the Intel processors. So it wouldn't be enough just to have a deterministic build. I don't know what would be enough. I'm glad you asked that question because I'm actually a little more optimistic about that um, relative to most people, I think. You see, hardware is relatively limited in what it can do. You know, strong AI does not exist yet. And if I'm using hardware that, was, that came from the past, prior to when I wrote my stuff, or at least somewhat prior, it's really, really difficult for hardware to know how to backdoor code written into the future. Now, there's exceptions to this. As an example, if I were his buddies with, say, the guy who wrote the you know, Intel Minix OS hiding around your, uh, your Intel CPU, maybe we could go work together to go compromise something. But it's much harder than just you know, inserting a bugged merge request. Like, it's, it is a risk, don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's actually the biggest risk out there. And I think once we solve a lot of these issues, those kinds of problems will not, I mean, with a lot of this stuff, like, it's sort of like, if you have a bunch of problems and you go solve them, the hardest, you know, the easiest ones to the hardest ones, sometimes you just go find out the attackers just keep on moving on to one, you know, one after another. Um, you know, some cryptocurrencies have this kind of issue where they keep on trying to add complexity to the tax, and the complexity is just a trivial thing to fix. I think the complexity of building backdoors that really survive multiple revisions of software is very hard. You know, this is why with Rust, for example, I don't think it's that likely for the Rust compiler to be backdoored in the sense that the people compiling Rust in an iterative process would have likely gone and you know, ran into this. I do think it's fairly likely that, say, Zcash could have, because the situation's a little different. With Zcash, it was something, it was a known target at the time. Whereas with Rust, if I go back, you know, 10 years and start compiling compilers, it's not that likely that bug's gonna affect something now. But, you know, in theory it could. And I think the best thing we can do there is do try to get more cross compilers. I mean, you know, there's a project um, written in C++ that can actually compile Rust, and the clever thing it does is it turns off the borrow checker, so it doesn't actually check if the code's perfectly correct, but it's still enough to get it compiled, and more people should work on that stuff. And also go plug my own project, Open Timestamps, which quite simply proves data exist in the past. If it exists in the past, you need time travel to go and change it. Or you do the attack in the past. Well, very frequently you can rule out the attack now, you know, and you can go show by the fact that that timestamp exists when, you know, when your window of vulnerability was and how unlikely it was. So definitely something to go think about. And incidentally, Bitcoin Core, a bunch of the people with merge access, um, you know, with, that, with those public keys do in fact timestamp every single commit. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I have a last question. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you develop in a different environment. So yeah. do, what kind of virtualization do you use? Or maybe some container or L LXC or something? Well, um, so for my desktop machine, specifically uh, Cubes. And, Love it. Uh, yeah. And uh, Cubes is kind of nice because it, it's designed around different realms, which are different virtual machines. And on top of that, it makes it fairly easy, but also you know, has good security for moving data around from one virtual machine to another. You know, and it's actual um, you know, proper like hardware level virtualization. It's not you know, some of the Linux container stuff that's always a little dubious. But 
you know, is it perfect? No, but I think it definitely reduces the chance of someone sneaking in a, you know, git commits into one of my projects and reading my mail. And I, I do think, think we need to do better. I mean, we, you know, someone needs to go write a plug into Cargo to fire up a virtual machine when you compile a project. And, you know, copy your code over and actually do all of the compiling somewhere other than where you're editing. But, you know, at least with cubes, we've kind of got some of this solved. And incidentally, if you want to do that project, Cubes does have the idea of disposable virtual machines, which are relatively quickly to, quick to fire up. So you could fire up a virtual machine, move the code in, do the compilation, and maybe keep it around to go and do changes. But, you know, someone's got to write it. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Are there any uh, last questions? Oh, we get one. Uh, love it. Give me a second. Um, thanks for the talk, Peter. Um, one of the challenges to some of this tooling seems to be like economic incentives. Like it's hard to productize them, like in a way that you can like do work on it and then like sell it and earn money. Um, I wonder if you had any thoughts of how that like how that problem can be solved so more people can afford to spend time on like making better tooling, um, sort of solving some of these problems. You know, I wish I had good answers to that, <laughs> but I, I think this is sort of a broader open source problem where. You know, in general, how do you get funding to go do things that are in the public good? And you know, I think you're quite right. I mean, especially with the example of GitHub, where some of these issues are sort of exacerbated by how it's much, you know, you make much more money by running a trusted service that people pay a subscription to. You know, maybe for some of this stuff, what we need is closed source software, or at least software with the code available, but you're still, but you know, it's still not released under open source license and you go pay for a copy. But I think the bigger issue may even be ignoring that. How do you actually get devs to use this stuff? You know, we, like, it's easy to go sign git commits. You install PGP and, you know, you set up some stuff and it just works. I mean, I've signed git commits for years. I figured out how to do that probably back in, what, 1999 or something. Like, it's, it's not that hard but so many people don't do it. The tooling exists for that. We don't really need more of that. We could use tweaks to it, but you know, to at least make an improvement, it's all, you know, everything's already there, it's just how do you get devs to actually do it? And unfortunately, I, you know, other than talks like this, like, I don't see good ways to do this. And you know, maybe some of the lawyers in the room might you know, start saying like liability law and stuff, which is an ugly tool to have to use. But, you know, maybe that's the sort of thing you need. I mean, I, I used to work in, um, you know, electronics engineering, and I'll make the point that in Canada, of course, I couldn't call myself an engineer, because that's a protected title. And if you actually call yourself an engineer, you know, you're filing off paperwork where you're attesting to the safety of something with your future on the line. You know, if we regulated software that way, yeah, probably some of these problems would go away, but it's not really something I think many of us want to do. And Maybe that's sort of part of our incentive there. If we don't do this, we don't fix these issues, we might see engineering-like regulations. And well, what does engineering-like regulations come with? I'm sure it'll look like a lot of other engineering where it's a bit more of a closed system and you have to go pass the right courses, get the right certifications to go work in the field. You know, if we don't solve these kinds of problems, maybe that's actually where things are gonna go. I think more likely, I mean, even the engineering world had it developed now, it might be actually a much more corporate thing, with only a couple companies even allowed to do engineering. And at least engineering is democratized in the sense that anyone who goes through the right process can get their stamp. It still could be a lot worse than that, but I don't know, maybe that's enough incentive for people. I just wish I had a good answer. Any other questions? Come on, we have still time. <laughs> Oh, there's one. Thank you. Great talk. I think the signing of commits is uh, necessary because uh, do you know what tool git blame someone else? <laughs> Basically, you can say uh, like Linus Torvalds uh, made this commit and you will push it to a repository. 
because GitHub uh, is using some meta metadata from the commit, and it will show that uh, he uh, pushed that commit. But it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's interesting, and I'll, I'll have to give credit to GitHub for this. It, at least in their UIs, they have the notion of verified commits on the website. So if you sign a commit with a PGP key that you've associated with your account, it will actually show up with a little green check mark in a way that won't happen if I just change the metadata. Yeah, but of course, that's a trusted system where I'm actually trusting GitHub to go do all that, and I don't actually know if they've done it. I would also remind the project from Frank Brown and Smuggler. They presented last year called Code Chain, I think. Yep. And um, do you think that uh, maybe the answer is uh, some vouch system for the developers? So you will, let's say, I trust this developer, I trust this one, and it will calculate the score of a project, of trustness of a project. Well, you know, my suspicion with a lot of this stuff is most of the problem is really just adding a bit of crypto to it so we can have some accountability to figure out what happened when something went wrong. You know, my, my suspicion is, again, I'll kind of go back to this sort of whistleblowing concept, is that what's most important is to make the attacks easily detectable and make sure the attacks are things that happen to all of us rather than none of us. And, you know, I didn't use this term, but um, certificate transparency has revolutionized the web certificate business. And well, what is certificate transparency? It's basically the thing that means that when I go log in you know, to my bank on my web browser, on my device, that I know that the certificate that's presented to me by the other ser server would have been known to the sysadmins of the bank. And I'll, I'll say them a little more precisely. So without certificate transparency, I have a chain of certificates from a root of trust, you know, set of entities that I just unconditionally trust that claim to go sign certificates that claim to be from my bank. What certificate transparency does is it adds a step where that first sort of linkage and ensures that those certificates were published in a widely visible database called a certificate transparency log, or as I would call it, a blockchain. The people find certificate transparency hate that term, but you know, that's ultimately what it is. And, you know, blockchains, but making something vi publicly visible and easy to ensure that other people could have seen the same thing. Well, because that happens, I now know that the sysadmins at my bank can check those logs and look for certificates issued that they didn't want issued. Now, it doesn't directly help me, but it does mean that the certificate authorities who have this, you know, have this role as a root of trust, that now they have a disincentive to abuse it because they won't get caught. And there's quite a few certificate authorities who CT has essentially shut down their businesses because their attacks got easily detected and they were detrusted. You know, we need to do the same thing with software. And my suspicion is if we do these things, what we're actually going to find is that things like adding you know, web of trusts and trying to have developers vote tree the other and so on. Yes, it will still be useful in higher security things, but I suspect that by itself will be enough to make most of these attacks go away. Although unfortunately, the other side of it then is sort of a social thing. It's kind of fun to be part of a web of trust, to be vouched for by other dev devs. You know, the fact that this stuff's kind of doesn't need these sort of second layers may actually hinder progress on getting stuff implemented. So maybe we need to go push that just to somehow gamify it, if you will, and get more devs doing this, these things. I don't quite know the right answers there, but you know, I certainly at least technically know, or at least I know at a technical level, the sort of measures that could catch a lot of these attacks. Uh, hi, Peter. Thanks for the talk. I have a question. Uh, it's regarding um, the spam attack that uh, Open PCP repository uh, had during June. Uh, basically, they uh, keep uh, like all the certifi public certificates there. Uh, I wonder if maybe using a blockchain, I'm not sure if Bitcoin or any other 
secure enough, uh, we can like uh, dismiss uh, that uh, spam attack because you need to spend money in fees. I mean, you certainly could do that. Um, you certainly could make adding a signature you know, and, and maybe I'll explain. So what that spam attack was, was of course, PGP does have that web of trust. You can essentially vote for other people. And the way PGP works is there are sort of centralized databases and centralized in the sense that any, you know, a small number of people run these, but anyone can go run their own and make a copy of it that go pass around these signatures, vouch, you know, these vouches from one person to another. And the way PGP tooling works by default is it just downloads the full set. So if you go and add a signature to my key, the tooling will download that signature, even though I never actually approved it. And there's some reasons why you want that, such as, you know, I want to, you know, if I'm a PHP user, I want to go learn about all the signatures. I don't want to have a manual, you know, approval attempt and so on. So certainly if you kept that model, you could use things like Bitcoin to make it expensive to spam. And that would probably solve most of that problem. But also point out, you can also solve a lot of that problem by just having people vouch for their for the signatures from other people on their keys. Essentially an approval process. You know, why should you be able to add data to my key without me approving? PGP could easily fix this, except for the fact that PGP is a widespread protocol, the tooling is kind of crufty and so on. You know, this is again one of these hard problems. And unfortunately, I think I've seen a lot in the security world, people not only really hating PGP, but really hating on PGP without any recognition of what it is good for, or how you would get alternatives and improvements. And I see very few people actually interested in replacing PGP. You know, we don't need to get rid of PGP, we have to replace it, because we are dependent on its security guarantees. You know, we don't use it as much as we should, but like it is kind of our last line of defense against a lot of these central centralized attacks by centralized attackers. So we have to replace it. You know, we have to make that ecosystem work again. What's the right way to do that? Well, you probably give 10 more talks on this, but it does need to be done, and it's not enough to just ditch it. And it is okay, too, if PGP is replaced by something that only devs use. You know, this whole bit of like, everyone's you know, pet gorilla needs to be able to go use PGP is I think a narrative pushed by people who may actually have bad incentives here and don't want us using security, you know, secure tools. We need to look at this saying, well, you guys are professionals, you people are developers. If you want to participate in these ecosystems of security sensitive software, here's some of your minimum requirements. And the minimum requirement might be using PGP version two, which might, you know, ditch some of this stuff, improve on other stuff. But the important thing is somewhere you are getting a signature there. So yes, I think this is fixable and, you know, blockchain might be a part of that. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter, you. for your talk, for your answers. Thank you guys for coming to this talk.